waste, and race in the United States. And this study was the first to verify that race was the primary predictor of where toxic waste facility was cited and income was a secondary indicator. So it's now been 23 years since Toxic Waste and Race was published and the perspective of environmental justice has become a household word in many communities, universities, and government agencies. Yet all communities are still not created equal. And not long ago, the EPA celebrated 30, its 30th anniversary of the Clean Air Act, yet the American Lung Association reports that 71% of African Americans, 80% of Latinos still live in areas that fail to meet air quality standards. We got started um, shortly after uh, the Toxic Waste and, uh, and Toxic uh, Waste and Race Report in 1987, um, when in 1986, this big sewage treatment plant was sited uh, along Riverside Drive in the Hudson River in New York. And, you know, people say people of color aren't interested in these issues, but we were able for eight years to get 200 people coming out every month to hold the city accountable for that plant. Until we got good politics in City Hall, we got rid of Koch, who said there was no problem, and we got David Dinkins, Trenton's son. And Trenton homeboy said there's a problem, we're gonna fix it. Spent $55 million to fix a brand new plant. And my organization worked with the Natural Resources Defense Council to sue the city because, you know, David was our friend, but he's not gonna be there all the time. You've gotta have a mandate. It can't just be that, you know, you know, Lisa Jackson's there and she likes us and we like her and so things are gonna be good. We have to have a mandate. We've gotta have regulation to ensure the sustainability of our communities. So in, uh, also just one other little uh, uh, comment too. We've had an 18 year 18-year grassroots campaign against the Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York City, largest bus fleet in the country. And that's because one-third of the bus fleet is housed in northern Manhattan neighborhoods. And so we have worked for 18 years. We've worked with researchers at the Columbia University School of Public Health to get data on what regular people in our community are experiencing, doing air monitoring, backpack air monitoring, dust samples in homes, to understand that diesel soot is causing low birth weight, developmental delays, and genetic alteration. We've got to begin to join forces with housing and tenant groups that have, you know, some of them have a lot of um, access to, to city and state government and the legislatures. So we've got to begin to develop um, and continue to develop those kinds of partnerships and develop a, and really scale up our activities in broad coalitions to really, really uh, create healthy, livable communities. Valerie Caffey, chair of the Environmental Justice Council of New Jersey and an area resident, moved into a discussion of the issues that are affecting the city of Trenton and its environs. She challenged the audience to, quote, take a breath of Trenton air. I'd like everyone right now to just take a nice deep breath. Oh yeah, and then exhale, right? Feels good, right? But do you ever stop and think, what you're breathing in when you take that breath. <laughs> okay, well right now we just took a breath of toluene, benzene, carbon dioxide, mercury, nitrogen oxide, soot, and a lot of other chemicals that are just too nasty to even talk about. Breathing, using water in the land shouldn't make us sick because the color of our skin or income level keeps us trapped in polluting areas. But this is what environmental racism and economic injustice do. They allow people of color and low income people to become disproportionately burdened with pollution and pollution's cumulative health, economic, and social impacts. People along Cancer Alley, though, have been fighting back. And Elizabeth, local activists have helped educate residents about the hazards of eating fish that are caught in contaminated water waterways. In Linden, activists stopped the waste transfer station and biohazardous medical waste treatment plant from being built. Pipe acts in other areas of the state. 
Jersey City was mentioned with the chromium cleanup. That's still ongoing. That chromium contamination is still not a dead issue. Waterfront South again was mentioned, and the people there, it's a, it's a small community. It's less than now, less than 2,000 people. It's also the state's poorest and, and one of the nation's poorest communities and one of the most polluted in the country. But the people there filed a lawsuit that um, forced the county sewage plant, which is right smack dab in their neighborhood, but forced that sewage treatment plant to install better technology to reduce some of the odors that come from that plant. But unfortunately, it still stinks because there's only so much you can do with raw sewage, quite frankly, when it comes to the smell. But it's better than it was. And then they also turned around when the St. Lawrence Seaman Company, which grinds up granulated glass furnace slag to put as an additive in things like concrete and other products, filed a lawsuit against the DEP and the company later on, charging it with environmental racism, charging DEP with environmental racism. And guess what? A federal judge agreed twice with the activists to say, yes, this is an example of environmental racism to put yet another polluting facility in a small community that already is overwhelmed with, with pollution. But environmental justice is more than just about the location of environmental hazards. Access to goods and services is also key, as discussed by philosophy professor Dr. Judith Stark of Seton Hall University. She focused on what she called food justice in Trenton, connecting this concept to ethical questions about achieving social good for all members of a community. Food ethics and the case for food justice. Now, you know, there are typically like three or four different definitions of environmental justice. Peggy mentioned one of the most prominent, equal distribution of environmental risks and benefits, fair and meaningful participation in environmental decision making. The one I want to focus on, though, is, I'm on that list, number four, and that is the capacity of communities and ind individuals to function and flourish in society. So what does food have to do with environmental justice? A great deal. Especially with the, that capability of communities and functions uh, and families to function and flourish is directly related to the quality of food that is available to them. One of the sections in this report is entitled Justice and Fairness with policy recommendations that are specifically targeted to making good, healthy, affordable food available to the city neighborhoods in Trenton. The report found the prevalence of food deserts in neighborhoods in Trenton in which residents lacked access to, to stores carrying good quality and affordable fresh food. Then I go into a sort of long section about what's called the capabilities model of, of human flourishing. This is sort of the deep humanities part of this. You know, there's no question about what constitutes healthy human nutrition. And likewise, we know very well what an unhealthy human diet is. A diet that is high in saturated fat, sugar, sucrose, especially high fructose corn syrup. Look at those labels, folks. It is everywhere in places that you would least expect it. Read that fine print on those labels. Sugar, salt, and one that contains highly processed and refined foods that are the recipes that lead to high rates of obesity and overweight persons in the United States. And it is no coincidence that these rates of obesity are particularly high in inner cities with high concentrations of low-income families and families of color. Trenton is not unique. Communities in Trenton have responded to these issues. Joni Sampson, a leader in Eyes of Trenton, described her longstanding roots in her neighborhood. The siting of a recycling plant there brought residents together. Through their efforts, they've learned from the history of environmental activism how to navigate through the environmental decision-making process. I live in the North Ward, east side of the North Ward. And are some of you from Trenton that live in Trenton? Raise your hand. I just want to kind of see who lives in the city. So I'm talking to a lot of people that don't live in the city and may not quite understand, I don't know your proximity to the city, but we got a big problem and we've been fighting for three years for this. I kind of fell into this. I lived in the township for many years. I was born and raised in Trenton, lived in the surrounding township, came back five years ago, bought a home. My 
Uh, auntie passed away. She lived in the house for 50 years. I took over the home. My cousin lives next door, lived in the home for 50. Before that, my uncle lived there, and then she lived there. So our family had been in that community for many years. And there's an investment in the community. Next thing that happened, I looked up, we looked up and we got a recycling center coming into our neighborhood. How did that happen? That's the question, how did that happen? Why would anyone wanna put a recycling center smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood where children live, where the elderly live, where families live? I'm talking about a recycling center that's within 200 feet do you know what 200 feet is? Where people live. New homes were built right across the street. Why would anyone want to do that? Why would anyone, our politicians, the people who make the laws and govern, we question what happened? But what does Trenton look like? What does Trenton look like? It's about 25, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, about 26% white. It's about 52% 50 black and 33% Latino. So add the numbers, do the numbers, and what do you have? A city where it's mostly people of color that live here. My neighborhood, it's a diverse neighborhood, but mostly people of color. The medium income for Trenton is 17 um, I'm sorry, per capita income is 17,000. The medium income is 35,000. I thought some interesting statistics when you look at the big picture, when you're talking about uh, environmental racism and how it happens in community. That's what our community looks like. So once we began to understand and figure out what's going on, who could we go to, who could say no to this, we came, we, we found out that through our attorney, environmental justice with their help, that the county could say no to this. They could turn this thing around because they had voted it, the recycling center, into the plan. But they could turn it around and say, we can take this out, and which they did. After some pushing and pulling, we had our day, what we call in court. Um, we presented our information to the uh, Mercer County freeholders. They voted to take it out. The company that we were fighting up against, they decided we're gonna sue the freeholders. They sued, they won. Now, right now we are in appeal status. We're still fighting, it's not over yet. And we're not giving up. We are not gonna give up. We are people that love our community, we believe in our community, and we're gonna stand up for our community. We may be grassroots, but let me tell you something. They depended on us not to fight. For several decades now, the environmental justice movement has taken a stand against planning decisions and construction projects that could alter the living environments and impact the health of communities across our country and our state. While the technical details may be debatable, a close look at the history of these struggles and the issues of class and race that they raise helps to focus the question of what constitutes justice when decisions impacting the environment are made. There are many ways that justice and the environment have intersected throughout New Jersey's history. Please check our website, www.njch.org, for more information and resources specific to New Jersey. For the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, I'm Bob Mann. Thanks for watching.